I'm not the type to believe in monsters or any of that nonsense. At least I wasn't until a couple years back when things took a really weird turn. I'm a surveyor by trade. I was out in the thick of the Colorado wilderness marking boundaries for a client looking to build. Beautiful country, but damned lonely, miles from any kind of civilization. I remember it being a day like any other, clear skies and a slight chill in the air. That day I was mapping out the south section of the client's property. I always enjoyed working that area. It offered great views, a lively creek, and the sound of birds trilling in the distance. The landscape was a mix of rolling meadows and dense pine forests, untouched and pristine. The seclusion didn't bother me. It gave me peace, a chance to get away from the usual city noise. It felt like my own slice of paradise, which was probably why I was caught so off guard when the day took a drastic turn. Honestly, I wasn't looking for anything out of the ordinary that day, just doing my job with my head stuck in data and measurements. But as dusk fell, that's when it started. I remember a smell, like rotting meat, stomach turning even for a guy who'd worked around roadkill before. It wasn't until I was deep in the forest a good two miles from my truck that the smell really hit me. It was putrid, as if the entire ecosystem was rotting away. My first thought was, maybe a bear had taken down something big like an elk, and I just stumbled into the aftermath. But this was something else, something I couldn't quite place. I felt it in the pit of my stomach, a warning sign of some sort. The normal hum of the forest seemed to quiet down, as if the birds and bugs were reacting to the same gut-wrenching odor. It was at that point I realized this wasn't just another day at work. Something was off, very off. Then in the failing light I saw something, big, nine feet tall, easy. I thought it was a dead tree at first, a really gnarly one. But trees don't change their location. And this thing did. It had the legs of an elk, long and sturdy, but something was horribly wrong. The skin was hanging off like it was rotting away. As my eyes adjusted to the encroaching darkness, I tried to make sense of the figure in the distance. At first it seemed to blend with the trees, so tall and skeletal. The antlers made it seem like a bizarre, grotesque statue, an artifact of nature worn by time and weather. I saw the flesh hanging loosely from its frame, revealing a skeletal structure beneath. It was as if the animal had been dead for months and was just an upright carcass. That's when a chilling gust of wind brought another wave of that terrible smell, and the creature shifted on its elk-like legs. I watched as this nightmarish figure detached from the tree line and moved towards me, becoming horribly real. The head is what really got me like a deer skull, antlers and all, but with two empty holes where the eyes should have been. Except they weren't empty. They were glowing, flickering between this unnatural yellow and an angry burning red. I remember the feeling of my heart thumping against my ribs as I watched this thing, this impossible creature, turn its head towards me. The skull-like face was a horrifying sight. The antlers added a certain sinister elegance, but those empty eye sockets, they were something straight out of a horror movie. Suddenly they lit up, first a piercing yellow illuminating the surrounding woods with a sickly glow. Then they switched to a malevolent red, casting an unsettling hue onto the decaying flesh that hung off its body. The sight of those shifting lights where eyes should have been, that's what kick-started my adrenaline and jolted me out of my stupor. What could I do? I was in shock and couldn't move. Then when the shock wore off, I ran. I didn't stop till I hit my truck, locked the doors, turned the key, and got the hell out of there. Never been so scared in my life. My work for that client, unfinished, and I never went back for it. Since then, I've been a changed man. I now keep a close watch on my surroundings. So make this a note to you, too. Be aware. Because if there's something like that out there, who knows what else might be hiding in the shadows. Ever since that night, I found myself constantly looking over my shoulder, both in the wilderness and in the city. I try to convince myself it was just a hallucination, a trick of the light, but the memory is too vivid, too real. I've started studying local wildlife, trying to match what I saw to some known creature, but nothing fits. 
I've taken up self-defense classes, even bought myself a sturdy hunting knife, just in case. I can't escape the feeling that I've seen something unnatural, something unexplained. It's taught me that the world is a lot bigger and stranger than we think, and that there are still mysteries out there waiting to be discovered, even if they're the kind you'd rather never encounter. My name is Blake, and I want to tell you about an incredible encounter I had in Yosemite National Park. I had been on a hiking and camping vacation with my family. It was a yearly event for us. This year was Yosemite, and a sunny morning the day that this happened. We had started our hike from a trailhead at the base of the mountains. I remember that the air was fresh, and the sound of chirping birds filled the air. We followed a winding trail that led us deeper into the heart of the park. At one point as we made our way up a steep path, my eyes were darting everywhere. I was always on the lookout for any signs of animals, and anything out of the ordinary. But little did I know that I was about to encounter something truly extraordinary. With all my excitement, I was in the lead and moving more quickly than the rest of the group. By quite a bit of distance. At one point I reached a clearing, and I started walking to the center. While I was making my way there I glanced across the clearing towards the trees on the other side, and suddenly I froze in my tracks. Standing behind one of the trees, about fifty feet away from me was a creature that resembled a human but one that was covered in hair. It was enormous, and as I looked I could see the face of a dog and shaggy brown fur and long muscular arms. But its eyes were wide and curious, and it stood on two legs just like a human. At first fear washed over me and my body felt like it was glued to the ground. But as I studied the creature I realized that it didn't seem aggressive or dangerous. In fact it looked just as surprised to see me as I was to see it. The encounter lasted for what felt like an eternity, but it was probably only a few minutes. We stood there, locked in a gaze, as if trying to understand each other. As I stood there staring at the creature in awe and disbelief, I couldn't help but notice its immense size. It must have been at least eight feet tall, towering over me like a giant. Its body was covered in thick, dark brown fur, which blended perfectly with the surrounding trees and foliage. Its muscular arms hung down by its sides, almost touching the ground. At first, my heart raced with fear. The stories I had heard about Bigfoot creatures flashed through my mind. But as I observed the creature more closely, I noticed that it had a gentle expression in its large almond-shaped eyes. It seemed curious, rather than threatening. The creature took a step forward, cautiously closing the distance between us. I held my breath, unsure of how it would react. To my surprise, it didn't move any closer. Instead, it stood there, tilting its head slightly as if trying to understand my presence. Feeling a mixture of fear and fascination, I decided to take a small step backward, hoping to create some distance between us. To my relief, the creature mirrored my movement, showing no signs of aggression. It was as if it understood my intentions and didn't want to scare me away. We continued this slow dance, taking turns stepping back and observing each other. It was a surreal experience, like being part of a silent conversation between two beings from different worlds. I felt a sense of connection, a bond formed through our mutual curiosity. Time seemed to stand still as we remained locked in our gaze. The forest around us was hushed, as if holding its breath, creating an atmosphere of enchantment and mystery. It felt like I had entered a different realm, a place where mythical creatures roamed freely. Despite the fear still lingering within me, I couldn't help but feel a sense of joy and wonder. I was witnessing something extraordinary, a moment that most people could only dream of. But as much as I wanted to stay and delve deeper into the encounter, a part of me knew it was time to retreat. With a final glance at the creature, I slowly turned around, my heart pounding in my chest. I made my way back to where my family was still working their way up the trail, my mind racing with a mix of emotions. I couldn't wait to share my encounter with them, to describe in vivid detail what I had just experienced. They could see the truth in my eyes. I recounted every detail, from the creature's appearance to our silent communication. They listened intently, hanging on to every word. 
Some were amazed, while others remained skeptical. Then, as a group, we all continued back up to the clearing, but despite all of us looking around, we found no further signs of the creature. The rest of the day passed by in a blur, a mix of breathtaking scenery and laughter with my family. We concluded our hike as planned, reaching our campsite just as the sun began to set. Emotionally, each family member had a different response to my unexpected encounter. Some felt a sense of wonder and gratitude, while others felt a lingering unease, a reminder of the unknown lurking within the depths of the forest. But we all agreed that it was a day we would never forget. And for me, a day that had affected me deeper than I ever could have imagined. It's taken me a while to gather my thoughts and get them onto paper, but here we are. My garage door, a solid metal structure that could withstand the wildest of storms, is now severely damaged, bearing gashes so deep and wide it's as though a wrecking ball took to it. And the stench that pervades the area, it's like the dank, decaying scent of a stagnant swamp mixed with something far more foul. So, here's how it all happened. A couple of weeks back, peculiar signs began appearing around my property. I found muddy footprints, each larger than my own foot, circling the perimeter of the house. But the most unsettling were the ones found near the creek, where I often go to fish. The prints were similar to those of an alligator, only much larger and significantly deeper, suggesting a hefty creature. It was a typical afternoon when I returned home from work at the local hardware store in town. My house is tucked at the end of a winding gravel road, surrounded by a dense green forest. It's typically a tranquil spot, the silence broken only by the harmonious symphony of nature crickets, birds, the rustle of leaves. But that evening, an unnatural hum in the air. As the day turned into evening, I went outside to pull my car into the garage. I had parked it closer to the front door when I originally got home. As I drove towards the garage, the headlights cast a pool of light around the area, and soon I heard an ominous sound echoing through the night. The sound of breaking twigs, but not the kind a rabbit or deer would make. This was something heavier, bigger. I stopped the car to listen better and then turned around to look towards the forest. That's when I came face to face with the unimaginable. There it was, a creature standing tall, a staggering eight feet at least. Its body was upright like a human's, but the way it moved was anything but. Its movements were jerky, graceless, and a grotesque parody of a human gait. The glare from the rear lights caught its eyes, yellow, piercing, gleaming with a malicious intent. The look in its eyes was cold, calculated, and terrifyingly intelligent. The eyes held an evil that spoke volumes just from its gaze. It was then that the creature moved into the light, and I saw it in full. Its face resembled that of a giant crocodile or alligator, complete with a broad, hardened snout and an array of sharp, menacing teeth. Its skin was a sickly gray-green, textured like rough scales, glistening wetly in the light. Powerful muscles rippled under the skin, hinting at the strength it possessed. I hit the gas pedal and drove into the garage, clicking the button to close the garage door behind me. I watched and held my breath as the door safely went down. And only then did I dare look out the door's top windows. But before I was able to make anything out without warning, it lunged at the closed garage door. The impact was loud, the reverberation echoing in the enclosed space as the creature continued its relentless assault. I stumbled backwards, my heart pounding as the door began to buckle under its force. I could hear the metal shrieking, an insane symphony of destruction that drowned out all other sounds. Suddenly it stopped. It wasn't because the door had given in or that the creature had tired. No, it stopped of its own accord, as though it had made its point. It gave a low, guttural growl, a chilling sound that resonated in the silent night. Then. Just as suddenly as it appeared, the creature turned and disappeared into the dark woods. I'm sharing this with you because I can't explain it. I can't dismiss it as a prank or a trick of the light. This encounter was as real as it gets. There's something out there, something we have no knowledge of or defense against, something we're not ready to face.
I'm a park ranger stationed at Yellowstone National Park. I moved out here about six years ago from Seattle, looking for a change of pace. The nature, the peace, it's all fantastic. But something happened a few days ago that's got me questioning the tranquility of my job. I was out late one night checking for any signs of wildfires, a typical part of my duties. That night, the dry wind was stronger than usual, an unfortunate sign of potential wildfire activity. I'd taken the ATV out for a more extensive coverage of the area. There had been a lightning storm earlier in the day, and I needed to ensure that no rogue strikes had started a fire. I had reached the northern boundary of my patrol route, a place dense with pines and rarely visited by parkgoers, when I first picked up on that disturbing scent. As I was making my rounds, I noticed an unusual scent in the air. I'm used to the smell of damp earth, pine needles, and wildlife. But this was different. It was pungent with an acrid undertone that reminded me of burnt matches or sulfur. It was then I heard a noise, not your standard nighttime rustlings or distant wolf howls. It was a guttural growl. My first reaction was to radio in some kind of animal disturbance, but as I fumbled for my walkie-talkie, a low growl rippled through the air, causing the hairs on the back of my neck to stand. It was a sound that seemed to vibrate in my very bones, almost as if the creature was more beast than the natural world could contain. I instinctively held my breath, my hand tightening around the flashlight. The rustle of the leaves around me seemed to cease, as if the very forest was holding its breath in anticipation. I turned my flashlight towards the sound and froze. There. Standing on human-like legs was this creature. It was massive, easily over eight feet tall with a large chest and wide shoulders. Its back was humped in a way that reminded me of a hyena or some type of canine. Its fur was an unsettling mixture of black, brown, and patches of gray. The creature's face was truly chilling. It had a long snout filled with a double row of sharp, menacing teeth. The fangs were clear as my light reflected off them. Its ears were pointed and the eyes, they were filled with an intelligent but terrifyingly demonic expression. The beam of my flashlight played over its monstrous form, the light seeming to be swallowed by the dark hues of its fur. Its eyes, glinting in the light, held a predatory intelligence that sent shivers down my spine. I could see the muscles under its fur ripple as it moved, a horrifying display of raw power. Its long snout twitched, the double row of teeth glistening wetly as if it had recently eaten. And those eyes, they seemed to look right through me, as though it was calculating, deciding what to do with this sudden interruption of its night. The encounter was like a fever dream. My blood ran cold, and every instinct told me to flee, but I was paralyzed with fear. The creature maintained its low growl, and for a few tense moments, we just stared at each other. The fear traveling through me was unlike anything I've ever felt. You hear about fight-or-flight instincts, but in this moment, I was paralyzed by the sight of this creature. My mind was racing to comprehend what I was witnessing, trying to reconcile the reality before me with my understanding of the natural world. The creature didn't move, maintaining its growl. We were locked in a terrifying stalemate, the hunter and the hunted assessing each other in a silent confrontation. Suddenly it reared up on its hind legs, let out a howl that echoed through the trees, and then bolted into the darkness. I stood there, still in shock, until the creature's howls faded and the oppressive smell lessened. Once I snapped back to my senses, I quickly made my way back to my vehicle, feeling a mixture of fear and relief. Back at the station, I locked all the doors and spent the night jumping at every sound. As I sat in my locked vehicle, I couldn't help replaying the encounter over and over in my mind. Each growl, the terrifying visage of the creature, its intense eyes, all felt etched into my memory. I spent the night in restless anticipation, jumping at every small sound outside, my eyes straining to penetrate the darkness outside the windows. The adrenaline wouldn't leave my system, leaving me in a state of heightened anxiety that made every shadow a potential threat. I felt a raw vulnerability, a realization that there were things out there in the night, things we aren't prepared to face. The next day, I went back to the location, trying to convince myself that it was just a bear, a trick of the light. 
but the sulfuric smell still lingered, and there were tracks unlike any I've seen before. That's when I realized I couldn't explain this away. It wasn't a bear or any other animal I'm familiar with. This was something different, something not of our usual understanding of wildlife. I haven't told my colleagues about this yet. I'm still trying to make sense of it all. Let me know if you'd like more details. I've got the whole encounter burned into my memory. Park rangers are experiencing bizarre, unexplainable phenomena. Some deem it as supernatural, while others see it as unexplainable. The first story I'm going to share highlights just some of the mystery. This story was submitted to me by a gentleman who referred to himself as Jason. Jason went on to tell me in his email that this occurred between 2005 and 2009 in a national park. He wished and requested to remain anonymous, but informed me that it's okay to tell you that it is in the northwest section of the United States. What's interesting about Jason's story is that he brings forth information about a search and rescue mission. They found a body about 40 feet up in a pine tree with wounds that were physically impossible for a bear to make. However, it was written down as a bear kill. After all, bears attacking and killing humans isn't necessarily new. But to write off these bizarre events as a simple bear kill, something just isn't adding up. Jason explained that for a while now, months before this even happened, he and his colleagues were hearing and experiencing strange things all around the park. They witnessed mysterious phenomena, mysterious black apparitions appearing out of the corner of their eyes, and strange lights and sounds appearing all over the park at all times of the day. But when you're on a job like that, you don't talk about it at work. Also, it's not something you're going to outright report to your superiors, and for good reason. For a while now, visitors across the park had been complaining about strange, disturbing noises. From humans screaming and yelling to strange, unexplainable animal sounds, all coming from the backcountry area of the forest in the park. But when the noises were investigated by rangers and staff personnel, there was no trace of anything, from tracks to any evidence of anybody being back there. It's as if these sounds simply manifested on their own and vanished when anybody would inspect what was happening. Apparently, some of Jason's closest colleagues and people he worked with had some strange experiences while in this small section of the backwoods. Although they refused to talk about it every time it was brought up, if the subject came up, they seemed to go pale and act scared, as if they knew something but were too afraid to talk about it. Now, this puzzled Jason. Remember that these particular events I'm now explaining happened before the search and rescue where the body was found and subsequently labeled as a bear kill. Other reports had come in that Jason dealt with personally. He also heard about how in these backcountry sites, food and supplies were being taken, but it was easily written off because animals can steal food and supplies, and the human noises or sounds could easily be written off and explained as foxes and mountain lions at night. Then Jason goes on to tell of a more harrowing experience. This was, of course, after the search and rescue find of the body. Some personnel were growing concerned because they believed they had a bear accustomed to human food on their hands, and that would only prove to be dangerous. However, Upon venturing back further, they found what appeared to be a den of some kind, and not that of a bear. One of Jason's closest colleagues also reported strange sounds like a mechanical humming in the woods right near where this den was. It was around this same den where he spotted strange tracks that he could not quite identify. In fact, they looked more akin to that of a goat track, but did not resemble any animal he is familiar with. For the following few days to come, they would spend time hiking throughout this small valley, and a bizarre, pervasive odor of death would always follow suit. In the same evening, while they were camping out in this small valley, they experienced a series of strange events that would occur over the course of the night. One of them reported strange whispers and hushed tones right near the tent, along with some strange gurgling noises. As Jason recalls, one of these park rangers ventured out beyond the reaches of his tent and the safety of the flashlight. Armed with a rifle, he set out to investigate the source of these strange noises. 
There was some moonlight giving brief illumination to the area around him, and as he could see off into the woods. He was shining and scanning with his flashlight, but he didn't capture anything. But there were a few moments where he swore that he could see a very tall, skinny silhouette watching him from the tree line, a silhouette that unmistakably was not a bear in any way, shape, or form. What's also strange is the ever-pervading odor of death in this whole valley. The rangers who had made note of it noticed that any time the strange occurrences happened, whether it be sights or smells or phenomena, this odor of death would increase tenfold. They explained it to Jason, who related to me like this. Imagine standing next to a cow carcass that had been dead for three to four days, baking in the hot sun, enough to make you gag. But there's no visible source for this odor to be coming from, especially not as strong and as potent as this was. The following day, they all returned to the main portion of the camp with no signs or evidence to further validate what the source of the noises were. Now, according to Jason, this only complicated things more as everybody was so perplexed at their findings. While everybody was creeped out, nobody was about to go ahead and point fingers at the boogeyman. You want to talk about keeping your credibility? That's not something you even hint at in a professional setting. What's also very interesting is that the same day in October, two hikers would end up missing around the same area where they heard those noises the previous night. Jason, who was now involved in a search party to try and find these two missing hikers, experienced a series of unexplainable events, sounds, and phenomena himself. These further validated the experiences of his two fellow colleagues just days before. While the two missing hikers were never found and are still considered several of the missing persons cases today, the experiences that Jason recalls were completely bone-chilling. This is beside the body that was found about 40 feet propped up into tree. They never could identify who the body belonged to, and there had been no reports in the general time frame of anybody gone missing. So the hiker was simply a Jane Doe. And in the end, this was yet another case written down as simply a bear kill. Even Jason, who had found the body originally, tried his best to rationalize the find as somebody having a very unfortunate run-in with a bear. But with how badly mangled this person was, which bears do not do, it did not line up with the way a bear kills. I'll let you guys be the judge on this story and let you speculate. Could this have been something supernatural? Does this have any connection at all to the thing chasing Jason at night or the experience the other two park rangers had in the valley? Or is this simply just a misidentification of an unfortunate individual being slaughtered by a bear? Those are just about all the details Jason gave me. So, I'd love to hear what you guys think. Was there something truly supernatural? Or is there simply a way to rationally explain it all with critical thinking and real-life evidence? I used to live in a quaint little two-story house located in the suburbs of Ohio. Its charm came from its age and a few unique quirks. One of those quirks was my room. It was more like a mudroom that was repurposed into a makeshift bedroom. It had our household washer and dryer in there, and a door that led outside, secured with a heavy deadbolt on the inside. But despite the odd setup, I was comfortable enough, except for one detail that would change my nights, and eventually my entire life. Life was simple, full of innocent childhood pleasures. And so, the first few nights after my mother decided I should sleep in the mudroom were uneventful. But then, it began. The door to my room would creak open in the middle of the night. All I would see at first was fog and a bizarre, otherworldly light seeping into the room. Then, he would walk in. The figure was peculiar, almost comical as I look back on it. Its upper body was that of a strange reptile, while the rest of it was decidedly human, garbed in a long brown detective-style jacket, complete with arms, legs, and shoes. As a child, I called him the Lizard Man. The absurdity of the sight did nothing to alleviate my terror. 
His gaze was cold, almost dispassionate, and he seemed to observe me intently before walking past my room and disappearing down the hallway. In the clear light of day, I gathered the courage to explore my room in the hallway where the lizard man vanished every night. There was nothing out of the ordinary that I could see. The deadbolt on my door was secure, and the hallway held nothing more sinister than family photos and laundry hampers. It felt normal, and yet every night the scenario repeated itself. The lizard man continued to visit for months. The routine was eerily similar each night. The door would open, the fog and light would filter in, and the snake man would stroll into my room, observe me, then walk away. The few times I mentioned the lizard man to my family, they brushed it off as childhood imagination. An imaginary friend, if you will. I got blamed for the door occasionally being left open, even though I would have needed a stool to reach the lock. My family remained blissfully unaware of the eerie occurrences in my room, leaving me to face the creature alone. The visits didn't let up, to the point where I dreaded sleep. Every creak of the house sent my heart racing. The fear I felt was palpable, lingering in the back of my mind throughout the day. It wasn't just the idea of a bizarre entity entering my room, it was the unknown. Why was he visiting me? What did he want from me? Even though the lizard man never physically harmed me, the sense of menace that clung to him was enough to make my skin crawl. The room felt colder and heavier on the nights he visited. My breaths came shorter, heart pounded louder each time that door opened. I began to research my strange visitor. I pored over books and surfed the internet, learning about folklore, mythology, and paranormal phenomena. My journey led me to various paranormal blogs and forums where people shared similar experiences, and there I found the term apparitions. From the common themes that emerged in others' experiences, I started identifying the patterns that matched my own. My visitor, I learned, was what some referred to as an apparition, a specter that presents itself to the living. Some online sources suggested that apparitions like the Lizard Man may represent unresolved issues, messages from the beyond, or even manifestations of my own subconscious fears. It was a complex realm of theories and interpretations. I couldn't discern whether the Lizard Man was a product of my mind, a spirit from another dimension, or perhaps a symbolic representation of some deep-seated anxiety. One thing was certain, the Lizard Man, in all his terrifying absurdity, was real to me. His existence, his frequent visits were part of my reality, even if they remained invisible to the world outside my mudroom-turned-bedroom. I decided I wouldn't let the Lizard Man rule my nights anymore. My solution was simple. I started sleeping on the living room couch. For years, that's where I spent my nights, away from the mysterious door, the eerie fog, the unnerving light, and most importantly, the lizard man. My family didn't understand, but they didn't object. The decision gave me a sense of control, something I felt I had lost with the lizard man's uninvited visits. I still felt the chill of fear every now and then, especially when I had to go near that room, but it was bearable. As strange as it sounds, I even found myself chuckling at the absurdity of the lizard man's appearance. My life went back to normalcy, or at least as normal as it could be with a nocturnal couch routine. The impact of those years, however, lingers. I am more aware, more open to the inexplicable aspects of life. The lizard man, in all his frightful strangeness, taught me that, looking back, I realized that the lizard man was not just a terrifying nightly visitor. He was a lesson a turning point in my life. He pushed me to question, to explore, and to confront my fears, however bizarre they may be. Today I maintain an open mind when it comes to the unexplained, the paranormal. I'm no longer the terrified child who trembled at the sight of a terrifying reptile creature. But I do retain a healthy respect for the unknown, a curiosity about what lies beyond our immediate perception. If I were ever to cross paths with the unexplainable again, I believe I'd be better prepared to face it, not with blind fear, but with curiosity and courage. And as for the Lizard Man, he is an unforgettable part of my past, a peculiar entity from my childhood nights. He doesn't visit my dreams anymore, but his memory remains, a reminder of the time when a terrifying lizard creature and a detective-style jacket were enough to keep a child awake at night.
I'm Sam, a geologist surveying in the remote areas of the Pacific Northwest. We were out here drilling for core samples to analyze the positioning of the strata of the region. It was late because we'd been working in the evening to avoid the heat of the day. While I was operating the drill, I started to pick up on something out of place. The smell. It was a sulfurous scent, like a struck match or a rotten egg. At first I wondered if the drill had hit something in the earth, but there was something else too. A noise, not mechanical or geological, but animalistic. A low rumble that you actually felt more than you heard. It was too quiet to be thunder, too resonant to be the machinery. The sound was persistent, almost rhythmic, like the pulse of a massive heart buried deep in the earth. As I tuned into it, it became clearer, a resonant growl, fluctuating in pitch that occasionally pierced through the hum of our equipment. The rumble, originating from somewhere within the darkness, felt foreboding and unnatural. Each time the sound rippled through the air, I felt a strange sense of anticipation, a nagging feeling that we were not alone. Then I saw it. Against the backdrop of the dense forest, a creature was silhouetted. Its height varied, I'd say, between six to ten feet. It seemed to shift somehow, as if it were contorting or changing shape. Its body was an unusual mix of features. I saw bat-like wings fold and stretch, and what looked like the head of a goat. There was something oddly reptilian about its body, though. I'd say it was brown or black, but the low light made it hard to be sure. The creature, although still shrouded in shadow, had a grotesque appearance that was a bizarre mix of animals. The wings were undoubtedly bat-like, appearing both leathery and solid. They tucked and folded against its body in a way that reminded me of how a bird shields itself from the cold. The head of the creature was a complete anomaly. With the profile of a goat, it appeared almost common, but the devilish twist in its features was far from ordinary. Its eyes, a piercing yellow, glowed like the beam of a flashlight cutting through the dark, focused and unyielding. Then there was the body which I could now see a bit better, scaled like a reptile. It glistened in the low light, reflecting an almost oily sheen. It was elongated and powerful, a contradiction to the typical form of a mammal or bird, but in sync with the abnormality of this beast. Its color, somewhere in the range of deep brown to black, gave it an added layer of menace, enabling it to blend effortlessly into the dark. It was clear this creature was adapted to its environment, a deadly predator lurking in the shadows. The sight of this thing, it gave me chills. Not just from fear, though there was plenty of that. More like a sense of profound unease, as if I was looking at something that simply shouldn't exist. Every instinct in my body screamed at me that this creature didn't belong here, or anywhere in the natural world I was familiar with. Yet there it was, real as anything else in that forest. Finally, it emitted a strange sound, a sort of roar, but I can't really describe it. Then it launched itself into the air, and with a gust of wind and a rustling of leaves, it was gone. After it left, I shut everything down, packed up as quickly as I could, and told everyone we had to get out of there. We were done for the day. Back at the base camp, I wrestled with how to convey what I had seen. I was met with skepticism, understandably. Their laughter was nervous, the kind that fills an uncomfortable silence when people don't know what to believe. A few exchanged glances, as if questioning my sanity. But there was also an undercurrent of apprehension. I could tell some of them were unnerved by the conviction in my voice, the detail in my story. I didn't expect them to believe me right away, but the doubt on their faces added another layer of unease to the already surreal encounter. It's one thing to experience something like this alone. It's another to confront the disbelief of your peers, realizing that your experience has isolated you in some ways. As days passed, an unspoken agreement seemed to take hold. We avoided discussing the incident, but there was a change in our routines. People stayed closer to the base after dark, the evening chatter was subdued, and there was an undeniable tension that lingered in the air. Even without any confirmation or validation, the group had been affected in some way by the encounter. It seemed to stir an instinctual unease in all of us, a primal part of our brains recognizing something inherently other. Since then, I've done a bit of research, trying to find any local legends or reports of similar encounters. 
I found a few here and there, but nothing concrete. It's unsettling not knowing what I saw, but I'm sure of one thing. I won't be returning to that drilling site anytime soon. I'm not sure that this is my story to tell. It was a story I heard from my father, and it was a story he heard from his father before that. It has affected us all, I guess. That's why I feel some ownership over the tale I'm about to share. It's followed our family for three generations. My grandfather was a hunter. He had a reputation. The best furs in Wyoming all had my family name attached to them. That reputation earned my grandfather some pretty historic invites. He met the vice president once. The invite at the center of my story, however, brought him to Yellowstone National Park. Nowadays, when you hear the name Yellowstone, it's attached to an idea of beauty, a scenic lake, hot geysers, and a slumbering volcano. That wasn't the case in the late 1950s. Mismanagement of the park and its fauna led to overpopulation and overgrazing. The vegetation was being stripped bare. Elk were especially problematic. The park district invited a few hunters to come into Yellowstone and deal with the elk. Hunting was permitted in Yellowstone at the time, so the act wasn't particularly surprising. It was the amount of death that shook the park district and jeopardized its relationship with the public. In the end, over 5,000 elk were killed. It was called an extermination. My grandfather was a part of that. His story wasn't about the elk, though. His story was about the thing that came out of Yellowstone, chasing all of that death. My grandfather had positioned himself in a clearing. He climbed a deer tower and enjoyed a 360-degree view of the area. It was only a matter of time before an elk came along. He missed his mark and hit the deer in the backside. The gunshot scared any other wildlife out of the area and the injury wasn't enough to put the elk down. My grandfather decided to give chase. He followed the trail of blood through Yellowstone. Strangely enough, it seemed the elk had led him back to a larger herd. Branches were trampled and the foliage was eaten bare. My grandfather slowed down. He was more interested in surveying the massive herd than he was in pursuing the single elk he'd hit. He was careful and quiet in the way that only hunters can be. When all the tracks he was following began to converge, he was certain that the herd of elk was waiting for him just through the next tree line. He pushed forward. When his vision penetrated the wall of chewed greenery, he came upon something else. There were no elk. There were signs that they had slept there. There were more grazing patterns and tracks around the perimeter, but there were no elk. It appeared that the herd had gathered there, walked tirelessly in a circle, and then vanished. He returned the rifle to his back and began to investigate. When the sound of a snapping tree branch came from nearby, he looked. He saw what looked like an elk's rack shifting among the trees. Then came its face. The head of a large bull with deep, dark eyes set in the back of its skull. My grandfather described this part better than me. He said the animal, while its body was still obscured by the forest, looked into him. He said those dark eyes glimpsed his soul. He described the light changing overhead as time seemed to blur and he became snared by the gaze of the animal. Eventually, the elk came forward. What stepped out of the tree line was no living animal. Below the neck, the elk's body was gaunt. Its fur was matted and patchy. When it entered the den, it stood upright. It stood at least 12 feet tall as my grandfather described it. When it shifted and lurched, he could see its tight skin dragging against its bones underneath. He said he felt it judge him. He heard a voice in his head, something that challenged the very purpose that had brought him there. He said, looking at the beast, that he knew immediately that he needed to stop killing. He couldn't continue as a hunter. My grandfather told my dad that he knew immediately hunting would lead him down the same emaciated path that had starved this creature. He said he knew he would become something like the monster he was staring at. Then. According to my grandfather, the beast wandered back into the woods. There were no elk left there for it to consume, he said. It moved on to find a meal elsewhere. My grandfather only killed a dozen elk that season. Out of the 5,000 total, 
Twelve isn't very many. The monster he saw forgave him for that dozen. My family hasn't picked up a gun since. My father swore that he'd never touch a firearm and I had no reason to. The hunting itch was out of our blood by then. We all know of the monster, though. We've all had that creature described to us with such detail that we never once considered going back on my grandfather's words. We all understand that lifting another rifle, taking another life, will invite whatever curse had deformed that thing. Then it will be us wandering in the woods, searching for our own kind. We never heard of any other sightings. None of the other hunters who came out of Yellowstone were changed in the same way as my grandfather. That massacre would lead to widespread change in the park district, though. Maybe there was enough death there to scare the hunters even without the glimpse of that creature to motivate them. I hear that Yellowstone is beautiful now. Like I said earlier, it's all geysers and lake beds now. I think I'd like to see it. I'd like to see the place where life was able to grow back. But the last thing I want to see is that creature. What if it decides it isn't looking for elk anymore? What if it decides that letting my family go was a mistake? My old house used to sit in a nice rural area in Ohio. It was a nice, tranquil area surrounded by trees, nature, and wildlife. It was about 10 miles away from Canton, if you know where that is. It was definitely a small town vibe where everybody knew each other's name and secrets were hard to keep. There was a local reservoir that I would frequently catch catfish in. It was a really cool place, and since there wasn't much else for a young boy to do in my town, I pretty much spent every single day fishing at the reservoir. Life was simple back then, but things changed when I saw something I would never forget in that reservoir. I was spending the evening with my friends, Kyle and Lenny. We were exploring the nooks and corners of our hometown. Eventually, of course, we all decided to head to the reservoir. We'd made our way to the swampy shores hoping to catch a catfish or two, but what we found was not a catfish at all. It was something different. As we edged closer to the water, a creepy figure emerged from the dark, rippling surface. It was taller than any of us, reaching almost seven feet. It had an unusual humanoid appearance but with no arms in sight, a sight so surreal it seemed like it was pulled from a science fiction movie. In our shock, we tried to make sense of what we saw. Green glowing eyes gleamed ominously in the murky darkness, and its feet, webbed and large, made a squishing sound as the thing tread across the swampy ground. Was it an escaped experiment? A cruel joke someone was playing on us? Or was it something inexplainable by anyone? Petrified, we could only stare as the creature moved toward us. Lenny, the bravest amongst us, stood his ground, not taking his eyes off the luminescent green orbs that stared right back at us. The creature stopped momentarily, as if studying us, before moving again. This time, its direction was clear. It was moving towards Lenny. Lenny, move, I remember yelling, but it was as if he was under some sort of trance. He just stood there, captivated by the creature's glowing eyes. Before any of us could react, the creature was inches away from Lenny. The eerie silence was broken by a soft squelching sound as the creature extended what could have been its mouth. In a moment of sheer panic, Kyle and I lunged forward, grabbing Lenny by his arms and pulling him away. We didn't stick around to see what the creature did next. Adrenaline pumping, we ran as fast as we could, leaving behind the chilling squelching sounds and the glow of green eyes. That night, none of us could sleep. We were haunted by what we'd seen, by the creature that had almost gotten Lenny. It was clear to us that what we encountered was no ordinary creature. The next day, we returned to the reservoir reluctantly. We wanted answers. We found large webbed footprints, exactly where we'd seen the creature emerge from the water. A chilling reminder of our encounter. We quickly decided to report this to the local police. I'll never forget the skeptical look on the sheriff's face as we narrated our experience. He humored us, visiting the reservoir to investigate. But his skepticism faded when he saw the footprints. Even he couldn't dismiss the tangible evidence right in front of him. Though we continued to fish at the reservoir, things were never the same. Every ripple in the water would send shivers down our spines. We'd laugh it off, joking about the lake monster, but the humor was tinged with a sense of underlying fear. 
As for Lenny, he's never been quite the same. He's quieter, more reserved. He was no longer the bravest amongst us, and there was a wariness in his eyes, a caution that wasn't there before. We never talk about that night. It became a silent pact between us. But the memory remains, etched into our minds, a chilling reminder of the day the Charles Mill Lake monster almost got Lenny. But life has a strange way of unfolding. I eventually moved away but came back once a year or so to visit family. So one cold winter night a few years ago I found myself back at the reservoir. It was not a planned visit but a spontaneous drive that led me there. Everything was just as I remembered. The cool breeze, the eerie silence, and the dark water surface. As I stood on the edge of the reservoir, staring into its dark depths, I realized that the encounter with the monster had left a deeper mark on me than I initially thought. It wasn't just a memory of fear. It was a lesson, a harsh one, that humbled me and shaped me into the person I had ultimately become. My encounter with the creature was a reminder of our insignificance and the infinite mysteries that our universe holds. Even today, the thought of that strange, horrid creature sends chills down my spine. But I know I'll never be able to shake it. That monster is a part of my story, a part of who I am, and I'll never be able to shake it. My father was in the military and my family moved around a lot when I was a kid. When I was about three, we moved into an old farmhouse. My mom had gotten me a toy fire truck for my birthday, and I loved it and would play with it all the time. It had lights that would come on when the wheels moved and a loud siren that you could activate by pushing a button. It was my favorite toy. One morning I had gotten up early and was playing with my toys on my parents' bedroom floor. My mom was very tired and she asked me to play quieter so that she could sleep for a couple of more minutes. Being only three, I said yes, but kept playing as I had been. Finally, my mom got up and took the fire truck from me to take the batteries out and give it back to me to play with silently. To her confusion, she saw that there were no batteries in the fire truck. Being exhausted, she gave me back the toy and tried to get some sleep. As soon as I started playing with the fire truck again, the lights came on and the siren was sounding at full volume. This freaked my mom out and she led me out of the bedroom. That night, my dad got home and my parents started discussing their day. My mom explained the incident with the fire truck to my dad, who immediately laughed it off. My mom was persistent and finally my dad agreed to investigate. After dinner, my mom led my dad into the bedroom and pointed to the fire truck toy on the ground. He picked it up and started fiddling with it. It had no batteries in it, and the lights and siren didn't work. See, my dad said, it just needs batteries. My mom was frustrated. I'm telling you, it was going crazy before. She grabbed it and started messing with it. No lights and no siren. She put it on the ground and told me to play with it. The second my hands touched it, the lights and siren went off. My dad then took the fire truck outside, grabbed a baseball bat, and began to repeatedly smash it into oblivion. I was too young to remember any of this, but apparently when my dad got back inside, I told him in a serious tone that Lily was displeased that he broke her fire truck. My mom and dad looked at each other in horror when I said that. Later that night, they put me to bed and laughed it off as an imaginary friend and simple glitch with the fire truck. Later that night, my parents awoke to a strong smell of smoke. Certain that the house must be on fire, they picked me up and rushed me out of the house in a panic and called 911. The firefighters came, and after a thorough investigation, they said there was no fire or even any smoke smell in the house. The smoke smell must have been coming from a campfire in the distance. A couple weeks later, my grandparents came to visit. We were all eating dinner one night, and my grandmother told me she has a surprise for me. I jumped up and down, excited, screaming, What is it? What is it? My grandmother laughed and said, Eat everything on your plate and I'll give it to you. After eating everything, even the vegetables I hated, I crawled up in my grandmother's lap and said, All done! My grandfather got up and went into the next room to get my surprise. I know your other one broke, so I got you a fire truck, sweetie, my grandmother said to me. I was ecstatic. It wasn't going to be the same toy, but I was going to have a fire truck again. I started squealing in excitement and running around the room in a frenzy. Five minutes passed and my grandfather didn't return from the bedroom. 
Hang on, sweetie, let me help your grandfather find your present, my grandmother said as she left the room. After about five more minutes, my grandparents both came into the living room empty-handed. I must have left it in the car, my grandfather said, and headed out the front door. I'll help you look, my dad said, and quickly took off after him. They were probably out there ten minutes when they came inside empty-handed. My grandfather looked flabbergasted. I was looking forward to seeing you play with your new fire truck. My grandfather told me, Oh, we probably forgot it at home. We will bring it to you next weekend, sweetie, said my grandmother. My mom laughed and said, Don't worry, he has enough toys. I was visibly upset, but I quickly forgot about it, and we all sat spending time with each other in the living room. About a half an hour later, a strong burning smell started to emanate from the kitchen. I must have left the oven on, my mom exclaimed as she ran into the kitchen. My grandmother followed her quickly to help. A few seconds after, we heard shrieks coming from the kitchen. My mom ran out to inform my dad of the situation. Before she could utter a word, I said, Lily is displeased. She liked the other fire truck better. How did... My mom started. My grandmother ran into the room and yelled, The fire truck is in the oven. Why would you put it in there, Frank? My grandfather looked confused. I didn't put the damn thing in there. Well, who did? Shortly afterwards, we moved out of that house. Dad got stationed somewhere else, and we went from state to state. I haven't had any paranormal experiences since and was too young to remember those events, but my family is still haunted by the experience in that house. My mom did some research and learned that a little girl had died in a house fire on that property several years before we got there. Could that be Lily? Is Lily's spirit the reason the fire truck worked without batteries? Did the spirit of Lily cause the house to reek of smoke? Did Lily put the fire truck in the oven? So many unanswered questions, but one thing is for sure. My entire family is happy to be out of that house. I don't think I received any more fire truck toys after that either, but I turned out all right. I am writing you from the Navajo Nation in New Mexico, near the border of Arizona. I felt the need to tell my story and the amazing thing I saw last night. As a Navajo Indian, we have always loved the world and what it can offer. We see beauty in the simplest things. We honor the animals we hunt. When the rains come, we savor the water as it allows the plants to grow again. And we've always looked into the night sky with wonder. Last night that sky brought something to the earth that I will never forget for as long as I live. We were outside performing a healing ceremony for one of our tribal elders who has lung cancer. We were singing and dancing and it was getting late. Just then the sky became very bright, like the sun in the midday. We saw a round circular ship that seemed to fall right to earth but land gracefully in a way that defied gravity. We heard a loud buzzing sound coming from the ship. The doors opened and out walked what can only be described as an alien, or one of the greys as I have heard people call it. It was short, off-white in color, and had large black eyes. Like that of a fly. We all stood frozen in the night. One of the young men from the tribe tried to run forward to protect the tribe, but the alien just looked at him, and he was frozen. In my mind I remembered the stories of what happened in Roswell. How a ship from the sky had crashed, but the remains were removed and never seen again. I knew that we were now seeing one of them alive. As thoughts raced in my mind, I could sense that the Grey could hear what I was thinking. It then began putting its own thoughts into my head, communicating without talking. It was telling me stories of how they had built the pyramids of Egypt, but man had taken credit for it. It told horrible stories of the thousands of people they have abducted and probed over the years, and of all the cattle they have mutilated in bizarre ways just to confuse man. Then the alien walked slowly back and forth looking at us. We smelled a strong earthy smell with a hint of sulfur. It was like whatever planet it was from had different smells than Earth. I then told the alien, using my thoughts, that we are Navajo Indians. We do not live by the ways of modern man. We do not abuse the earth. I said your problems are not with us and we want you to leave in peace. The Grey spoke to me telepathically again, saying it understood. It said soon it would attack the big cities, where man makes nuclear weapons. It said soon the world would see destruction like it's never seen before. 
Just then, the little alien walked onto the ship again. It walked like a small child would, using its short legs in small steps. The door closed and the ship blasted far above the stars in an instant. The alien was gone. I pray that it never returns and what it said will not come true. Being a ranger isn't always easy. Sure, I get to see some of the most beautiful scenery in the country and talk to people from all walks of life. In addition, it is a great career for someone like me who just loves being outdoors. However, dealing with those who are uninformed and do not understand the park rules or how our park society actually works can be difficult at times. And a lot of them don't even realize that the rules are there to protect them from things they couldn't even imagine. I once read something on a Reddit thread about how Stephen King must have had a park ranger on retainer to get story ideas. While I highly doubt that it is true, we do see stuff that I bet most horror writers couldn't even dream of. One thing that never fails to freak me out, no matter how many times it happens, and it is way more often than you would think, is when you come across something that has absolutely no right to be there, and you have no clue how it could have possibly gotten there. Staircases being discovered, okay, you might think at some point there must have been a building many years ago, and all that's left is the stairs. The only issue being that the trees surrounding the structure are hundreds of years old, and the stairs are not, so there couldn't possibly have been any building there, and none of the trees are damaged, and there is no route or trail leading up to the area for some big-time practical joker to plant it there for some YouTube show. They're just there, the same with abandoned cars. They appear in areas that have been looked at many times before, maybe on foot or with an ARV, but again there is no way a truck, camper van, etc. could have gotten there. Yet we find them sometimes in a state of decay, showing the vehicle had been there for years, when in reality that area had been checked and reported back on only a few days ago. Sometimes when we check, the vehicles are registered to people who have been missing for years, other times, they just don't seem to exist in the system. And once in a while, we find a person, sometimes alive, other times just a body. Sometimes they actually are hikers or hunters who've lost their way, and other times, they are not. We have found people wandering around in places that had been checked only a few hours before, looking like they've been lost for days. When we finally manage to convince them that we are the good guys and want to help, we find that they've been missing for days and weeks and are not even from the U.S., let alone this area. The scariest part is that they have no idea how they got there. These are ordinary people who at one moment are sitting at a desk in Germany. The next thing you know, it's three weeks later, and they're here in America, having no idea how they ended up here. You won't find these sorts of reports on your local news, so don't bother looking. We take them straight to a government building and, well, they deal with it. So next time you are hiking and you've been doing it for years and a ranger tells you not to go somewhere or you're hunting and they tell you to avoid a certain area, do what they say. We are not being a pain and trying to ruin your day. We are looking after you because something is out there, dumping bodies, cars, even people into our forests and parks. If something or someone is doing that, then maybe, just maybe, they're also taking things. And the hikers that go missing, just maybe, they were not dragged off by a bear or fell down a ravine and were eaten. Maybe they'll turn up somewhere in the middle of the desert, in another country, and that country's government will come along and deal with them. And from what I've seen from the few moments I've spent in the company of one of those people, you do not want that to be you. I am writing to you from Kutztown, Pennsylvania. I am an avid rock climber and often take my skills out of the climbing gym and into the real world. This type of climbing is considered bouldering and me and my friends try to get out just about every weekend. Well, this time that we tried to go climbing, all of my friends ended up bailing on me. They all had something to do or somewhere to be, so I had to go solo. This was my first mistake. In general, it is a terrible idea to go climbing alone because of the risk of injury and all, but I told myself I'd take it easy and only go on the easiest routes possible. 
There are several spots in my area with good conditions for climbing, and I have been to nearly all of them. I decided to head out to one of my favorite boulders and start to test out some problems. Entering the parking lot for the campground, I only saw one or two cars, but that wasn't odd for a midday climb. You need to hike about 15 minutes into the forest in order to get to these rocks. It's a heavily wooded area with a canopy of deciduous trees and tall pines all over. You can see a ton of wildlife like squirrels and deer and songbirds all bustling about. It was midday when I went over there and the sun was out, so it was really a nice and peaceful mood. Walking into the forest, I didn't notice anything weird, but I did have an odd feeling in my gut. I felt like maybe I was being watched or something. I thought I was nervous to be climbing alone, and that's how I explained away the fact that I kept hearing footsteps behind me. Each time when I turned around, there was nothing there. My gut started to twist a bit, but I'd already driven all the way out there and hiked all the way over. Once I reached the rocks, I set up my equipment and dusted my hands with some chalk. I took a long look at the boulder that I wanted to scale and decided what I presumed the easiest path would be. The boulders in this area were steep and made of a crumbling granite with small holds. As I got going, I felt more and more confident. I was doing fine and getting some great climbs in. Truly, I didn't want to push my luck and try out anything too tough. I stuck to the lower levels of the rocks and mostly tried problems that I'd already done before. Oh, that's what the paths are called in bouldering and rock climbing problems. But the biggest problem I was facing was the fact that I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. No one else was in the area, and I'd only seen two hikers as I was walking in. I didn't know if it was just my nerves or something else. Every time I'd turn to begin my climb, I'd hear a rustling in the trees. It almost sounded like someone or something was running in circles around me. Each time I'd flip my head around to look, but in that instant it'd be gone. I just kept climbing though and eventually my hands felt super sore and my legs were about to give out. It's hard work hurling yourself up a wall and I'd been out there for more than two hours. So I packed up my stuff and started to make my way back to my car. This is where my story starts to get really strange. I just couldn't find my way back. The trail that I took into the park seemed to have vanished. I began to panic. I'd only hiked in about half a mile, but I didn't know which way I'd come from. I couldn't find the dirt path that had led me there. I walked in circles around the perimeter of the boulder. I decided I needed to get a better vantage point. Not worrying about my previous fears of being alone, I chalked up my hands and started climbing up the tallest boulder so I could see above the trees. In all honesty, the problem was not too difficult, but I was increasingly nervous now that I was lost in addition to being alone. Once I reached the top, I wished I was alone. Standing at the bottom of the cliff was a hideous creature. It had antlers and a body like a deer, but its skeleton was exposed and showed through peeling flesh. It had glowing eyes that flashed red as it stared up at me. I think it had been watching me that whole time. As we made eye contact, it stood up on its hind legs and shot its bare head into the sky to produce a terrible noise. The sound was a cross between a horse's neigh and a scream from a terrified child. I ducked down on the boulder and tried to hide. When I peeked down back over the rock, it was gone, and I spotted the path that would get me out of there. I tried to maneuver myself down the boulder as quickly as I could. Once I reached the ground, I needed to cover my nose. There was a stomach-churning smell of rotting meat and garbage at the base of the rocks. I held my breath and skittishly ran to my car. It felt like a much longer hike on the way out, and I was completely out of breath by the time I opened my car door. After that day, I never saw that thing again. I also will never go climbing alone. I wonder if the creature I saw could have been a Wendigo. I haven't heard of them being so far east, but maybe there is something to it. Please let me know your thoughts in the comments. Some of the things people experience blow my mind. I've been a police officer for about three years, and already I could write a book on some of the experiences I've had. I have to tell you about this crazy call I responded to that I could only describe as paranormal. I got a call in about a man who claimed that someone was breaking into his house, 
so I turned around and headed to his address. He lived in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by woods for miles. If someone was breaking into this guy's house, it was someone who knew him well. I got out of the car and started looking around. The windows of the house were broken, and the door was busted in. I pulled out my gun and yelled, Police, come out with your hands up. Thank God, a man screamed, and it almost got me. This was clearly the owner of the house, an elderly gentleman who was shaking in fear. I asked him if there was anyone else in the house, and he told me he was alone. I asked if the burglars were still around, and he said it was no burglar. The demon, it almost got me. I told him to wait in the patrol car where it was safe, and I started looking around the house. I checked every room in the house and didn't see any signs of anyone still there. I circled the outside of the house and looked around. All of the doors and windows were bashed in, but I didn't see any evidence of the criminal still being around. I asked the old man to get out of the patrol car and we sat down outside. I told him to take deep breaths and calm himself down. I told him the calmer and clearer he was, the better I could help him find the criminal responsible. The man laughed at me and said it was no criminal. The demon will keep trying, but he'll never take me alive. I asked him what he meant, and he said that a demon lived in the woods behind his house. He would see him poke his head out from the trees from time to time and disappear back into the woods. Then the demon got braver and would look through the windows until the old man saw him and he'd run back off into the woods. He only recently started trying to attack the old man, and this time was the closest he got. The old man described the demon as having pale white skin with large black eyes and a huge mouth. He said it was skinny and tall, and it ran on all fours like a dog. I didn't know how to take this. The man was pretty old, and I doubted he had the capability to bash the windows and doors in himself. He didn't seem crazy, but the demon he was describing couldn't possibly be true, could it? The way I saw it, someone tried to hurt the old man, and maybe it was dark, so he thought he saw a demon. When someone is under that kind of stress, they often recall details inaccurately, and that could be the case here. It could also be somebody wearing some sort of mask to disguise their identity. Either way, I didn't feel good about leaving the old man alone to be attacked again. I asked the man if there was someplace else. He could stay and he refused to leave. I'm going to be the one to shoot this demon, the man said. I want to be there when the life leaves his eyes. My face will be the last thing he'll ever see. I didn't want to leave the man, but I got another call that I had to respond to. I checked up on the man about a week later and he had his windows and doors replaced and seemed to be in a pretty good headspace. One night I responded to a call about someone trying to break into a house. When I looked at the address, it was the same as the old man's. I turned on my lights and siren and sped there as quickly as I could. When I arrived on the scene, the windows were bashed in again and the door was kicked in. I pulled out my gun and shouted, Police, come out with your hands up. There was no response. I called for the old man several times and got no response. I walked into the house and started looking around. The door to the bedroom was kicked in and a trail of blood went from the bedroom out the back door. I followed the trail and it was clear a body was dragged out into the woods. I called for backup. I was not about to head into the woods with a murderer by myself. The backup arrived and we searched all night but couldn't find the old man anywhere. That morning, we found him several miles into the woods with huge bite marks all over his body. Someone or something feasted on the old man. The officers talked about the cannibal in the woods, but I was starting to believe the old man's story. This thing attacked the poor man several times and ate him. I'm not saying that humans aren't capable of cannibalism. After everything I've seen, I can tell you that humans are capable of unspeakable things. But the old man described this creature vividly and saw him on multiple occasions. I feel responsible for his death and I can't let it go. I can't imagine going out that way, being eaten to death. Nobody deserves that, especially not that old man. Here in the remotest parts of this land, we don't see much at night. However, I feel compelled to write about an incident that happened back in autumn of 2002. Something that has disturbed me ever since and made me feel afraid to sleep or even leave my house for a long time. 
I was living in a farmhouse with my new husband and daughter. My daughter at the time was only around six months old, and she kept waking during the night. I would have to get up with her at least once every night to settle her, feed her, and pacify her. At times I would sing a lullaby in the kitchen as I cradled her, and I would look out at the empty apartment blocks. Mostly I liked looking at the small communal garden we were given as a grant from the government. On one occasion my husband made a joke that my lullaby would attract criminals to the apartment complex. It was quite a haunting tune, he said. It was a tune that my own grandmother had sung to me, and she left me the words on a little sheet of paper. She always told me that it kept evil spirits away and would protect the crops from any scourges. I was not aware that it sounded haunting because I was so used to it and honestly soothed by it. But occasionally, as I sang it to my daughter, I would see little flickers of light out in the other windows of the apartment complex, as if people had awoken to my singing. On this particular night, I was singing the lullaby, and then heard a screeching sound from the small garden outside. Walking over to my window, still singing the lullaby, I saw something that nearly made me drop my daughter. This creature, something that was not human, was something I'd never seen and it was like it was staring at me. Red eyes, but slits almost. It appeared to be the size and shape of a hyena, and that was really the only creature it reminded me of. It was brown and had kind of a long tail, but what was most peculiar was that the creature had large wings. They kind of extended outwards like a huge web, and it was really pale on the inside. It was bizarre and frighteningly ugly. I covered my daughter's eyes, but I had a feeling that she had glimpsed it. Its face was weird, too. It was kind of goblin fox-like. And it had strange features and was terrifying and demonic. I tried to call for my husband, but words would not leave my mouth. I was totally perplexed by this creature that was sitting in the garden just yards away. I felt sick and troubled. Where had this creature come from? What did it want from me? These were all questions that stirred in my mind, and eventually I managed to back away from the window and walk up the stairs. I awoke my husband, who totally believed me, and came down with a raised baseball bat. When we got down to the window, the creature had gone. We debated calling the police, but we decided not to. We didn't want to make the police think that I was off my rocker and a threat or danger to my child. All I know is there are wild and not-so-wonderful creatures in the animal kingdom, things that even the most explorative environmentalists can't comprehend. Whatever it was, I saw it with my own two eyes. And because it was so disturbing, I have lived a life fraught with tensions and anxiety ever since. My daughter, too, has now encountered problems of her own. Now 20, she still experiences night terrors and calls me in panic if she is home alone. It's as if that memory has been etched into her brain. But I have never brought it to fruition. I have never discussed it with her, but it's definitely affecting her. Now, we stayed at that apartment for two years after the incident, and any time I had to wake during the night to go to the kitchen, I would feel dread, expecting to see this thing out there again. I feared it was waiting to reappear and resurface those horrible memories. Thank goodness my husband came down with me every time after that, and luckily, as my daughter got older, I had to do it less and less. It never did surface again. That was the only time I would ever see it. I've always loved horseback riding. It's a mutual agreement of respect and trust. Every chance I got, I would saddle up and ride the trails around Bangor, Maine, my home for the past few years. One evening, I decided to take a leisurely ride around my favorite trail. It was probably late November. We'd been riding for about an hour when my horse, Bella, started acting twitchy. Now Bella was as steady as they come. I'd ridden her in thunderstorms without so much as a flinch, so to see her this nervous was cause for concern. I tried to soothe her, running my hand down her neck and whispering reassurances, but she wouldn't calm down. Despite my initial instinct to turn back, an unexplainable drive prompted me to push forward. The path ahead was shadowed, the setting sun making the once familiar trail seem alien. I dismissed Bella's nervous whinnying to a distant coyote's howl or some unseen deer merely startled by our presence. As we continued deeper into the woods, a musty, damp smell filled my nostrils. 
It was heavy in the air. The surrounding area was eerily silent now. Suddenly I heard a loud noise that made me nearly fall off Belle when she spooked. It was a strange sound, something between a yelp and a growl. It was a sound I had never heard in these woods before, not in all my years of riding. The echo reverberated through the woods, bouncing off the trees. The effect was immediate. A primal fear began to stir deep within me, and I felt all the small hairs on the back of my neck stand up straight. Something was wrong. I began to notice odd things along the trail. There were footprints that were way too large to belong to any animal I knew, and besides that, they looked human. Only there was one problem. The person who made them wasn't wearing shoes. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to Maine before, but it gets pretty cold around November, and it wasn't exactly the time of year you could be walking around barefoot. Tree branches started snapping around us. There was something out there. Cautiously, I urged Bella onward, my senses now fully alerted. I was expecting to breathe a sigh of relief in a moment, when it would inevitably turn out to be a raccoon or a deer close by. But that's not what happened, not at all. Just as we were about to turn a bend, a hulking figure stepped into the middle of the path. A look of disbelief filled my face as I tried to comprehend what my eyes were seeing. This was no ordinary animal. Its dark, coarse hair was somewhat like a bear's. It must have been six, maybe seven feet tall, and stood upright just like a man. The creature had a strange conical shape to its head, but it was distinctly ape-like. I swallowed my fear, attempting to make sense of the moment, but the creature changed its stance, revealing piercing, beady eyes, an intense shade of black from what I could make out at this distance. Our eyes locked, and a jolt of adrenaline hit me. Bell stomped her hooves nervously on the ground, and I could tell she wanted to run. Before I could even think to retreat, a low growl rumbled from the creature. I dug my heels into Bella's side, spinning her around, desperately urging her to gallop back the way we'd come, in a frantic bid to escape. As I rode away, I heard the crunching of leaves and breaking branches behind me. A strange, loud whooping sound echoed in the silent forest, following us long after the sight of it was lost. We burst out of the woods and made it back to the barn. After stabling Bella, I numbly stammered through my encounter with the creature to a few bewildered friends, their eyes wide with disbelief. My mind raced, the echo of the Sasquatch's growl resonating in my thoughts. I was sure that's what it was. Nothing else made sense. The sight of its colossal form and that eerie whooping noise painted a chilling specter that refused to fade away. The days that followed were spent in anxiety, filled with intrusive thoughts about the encounter. I couldn't get myself to venture back to those trails. The figure haunted my dreams, those beady eyes seared into my nightmares. Reportedly, other locals and visitors around Bangor had begun to experience similar instances. Stories of brief sightings, inconceivable sounds, and rumors that our peaceful city was home to a Sasquatch spread far and wide. I was one of the few who had seen it, whether you believe me or not. When I was a student, I volunteered in my local library on Saturdays to try and get some work experience. This was an enjoyable job, and one that I truly did enjoy. It was an old library that had been built in the 16th century, so all the architecture was old and gothic. Apparently, during the 16th century, it was actually used as a prison for suspected witches and black magic practitioners. There was an ancient and spooky feeling in the library, but for me it was a fascinating place to work. On one occasion, however, my last shift to be exact, I encountered something terrifying. After our building supervisors had left the building, it was up to myself and a colleague to ensure that all users had left the premises. When I was doing my end-of-day checks, I went to check on the bathrooms. We had a recurring problem in which local drug addicts were using the toilets as a place to shoot up, so I was slightly anxious about doing this. As I walked over to check, I heard a growling or a grunting noise. It was unusual, and I assumed that somebody had passed out in the bathroom stall. When I opened the door, I saw this strange being. It appeared to be like a short person, but kind of like this disgusting ogre. But imagine it being more like an imp, I guess is what you'd call them. 
about a foot or two high, strange skin, pointed ears. It literally looked like a little demon. I, in that moment, was petrified and terrified at what I was looking at. This thing was staring right at me, and I wondered if it would strike and assume I was a threat. But it remained passive and stared at me with these small, beady black eyes. I attempted to call for my colleague, but my voice was so faint. Nothing happened. Within seconds, this creature or being just evaporated. Like that. Just gone, dematerialized in the air. My colleague came in, wondering what I wanted. She saw that I was completely terrified and confused. That's when she began to doubt my own sanity. Had I simply imagined the whole experience? I feel that whatever I saw got scared and maybe it's some sort of demon or a shapeshifter. I don't know. Anything. Earlier that day, a customer had actually reported seeing this unusual bird that flew into the library and sat outside. I mean, if that's what it is, it is fascinating that such things of the paranormal still exist here. Due to all the witch and black magic practitioners that existed here at one point, I wonder if there's any connection between the two. I'm writing this to make an inquiry about the disappearance of a French student known as Michelle. I know this sounds odd, but Michelle was last seen hiking in the Six Rivers Forest here in California back in 1996. I think I have a lead. So I was hiking in the Six Rivers Forest a few weeks back with a friend. We are both seasoned hikers, and we're so used to seeing strange creatures, strange flowers, and growths. But we encountered something that to us, looked dangerous. Something dreadful and unusual that had the potential to kill. There was an open grassland area in which we were both walking. The path was steep and mucky, so it was becoming quite strenuous for us both. What was odd was that it was early, around 11 a.m., but the sky was becoming sort of a dark orange hue, as if it were early evening. When we looked around, there were no other hikers, which was also odd, but we shrugged our concerns, continuing on our path. As we got deeper into the path, we came to the peak of the mountain where we overlooked a sort of valley with overgrown foliage and densely packed wooded areas. My friend shouted, Look! And my eyes swept down to see something in the valley, something that I initially thought it was just a hallucination. It was a creature such as I'd never seen before. It was made up out of trees and branches and foliage, but it was in the shape of a large deer. It was green and appeared to be decorated. The branches throughout its body, too, were decorated in various patterns, kind of giving it a sense of structure, and that it did. As I had good eyesight, I could make it all out clearly, and could see even its face had tiny eyes. Its antlers, too, were made up of branches and wood. I would have thought it was a design of some sort or some mural, but it was moving and walking around. It lowered its face to the ground, seemingly for food, and every so often, little sparkles of gold dust flew out of its antlers, dancing into the morning sky. When we took out our cameras, our phones wouldn't work. It was so frustrating because we had never seen such a thing before. It was walking around a small open area surrounded by woodland and a small pond. When I focused further and got a little closer, I could see that around the area were several skeletons, fully formed and lying as if to mark a territory around this thing. At that moment, my blood got cold and I got scared. I grabbed my friend and he pulled me back. After that, we walked carefully back up the path to the north and back to the peak where we originally descended and made our way back to the car. The whole time I was walking back, I felt like I had crossed some boundary, some marking the land that was designed to keep people out. I was also thinking of Michelle a lot and couldn't help but feel that people had gone missing in the forest. They couldn't have possibly been harmed by this strange creature. I figured that even as a park ranger, in their infinite wisdom of nature, they know that this is not beyond the realm of possibility and that things exist within the universe that we have not quite grasped. Therefore, I'm contacting them in hopes they can help me search the area, preferably with a team and a chopper. I can give them exact coordinates on the map where we encountered this thing. We owe it to the people who enjoy the forest, for our children and their children, for Michelle and her family.